You can ask me anything you like. Okay. <clears throat> and the fact that I don't know what you're going to ask me is pretty pretty cool. Okay. I like it. <laughs> okay, Joe, so um, when did you get involved in politics and what motivated you or inspired you to do so? Well, I first ran for state representative in 2006 uh, as a state representative in the 48th Legislative District here in Tennessee. Um, we were unsuccessful in that attempt. Um, we, in 2008, followed up to run again when the incumbent Democrat, John Hood, resigned. Uh, retired from that seat, and as a result of our efforts in 2008, I'm proud to say I'm the very first Republican ever elected from the 48th Legislative District to serve in the Tennessee General Assembly. So we're real excited about that. I've been serving ever since, and uh, as you can imagine, I'll be retiring very, very shortly. Okay, so um, seeing that you're the first Republican in that district, how, how is it, um, how the people reacted to that in your district? Well, the district has always been pretty conservative. Um, what happens is, is, is so many times people tend to adopt their pol political affiliation a lot like they adopt their religion. And after several generations, they don't really understand why they have called themselves Republican or why they call themselves Democrat. But here in Middle Tennessee, and in particular in the 48th Legislative District, there were a lot of very conservative Democrats who came to me and said, Joe, you in your election cycle through your campaign, you helped me to realize that the Democratic Party left me, and what I was left with was a Republican Party that emphasizes personal responsibility, individual liberty, and the sovereignty of the states through free and fair markets. And so... That was I've always been our campaign theme, even our, our campaign theme when running for the United States Senate. And as such, it resonates with a lot of people, whether they're Democrat or Republican. Okay, so um, what motivated you to move on from the state to the, <clears throat> to the federal level? Well, that's a, that's a rather long jury, so I'll give you the condensed Reader's Digest version. Uh, this time last year, I was running for Congress in the 4th Congressional District, and we were doing so well. Uh, that whenever we traveled throughout the district, we always received uh, two questions. Number one, how can we get involved in your campaign, Joe? We love your message about personal responsibility, individual liberty, and free and fair markets and sovereignty for the states. And then the invariable second question to that was, have you ever thought about run, running for United States Senate? Lamar Alexander has abandoned us. He's abandoned us whether it's on cloture for Obamacare, he's abandoned us on uh, raising taxes, he's abandoned us on voting amnesty for illegal aliens, and then most recently he's abandoned us on voting for cloture to take away veterans' benefits. So right on down the line, Lamar Alexander unfortunately has a history of voting with the policies of Barack Obama more than he has with the policies of us Tennesseans who are conservative regardless of our political affiliation. And after several months of persuasion by some businessmen in, in Nashville, uh, particularly uh, Lee Beeman and, and some of those people, um, I determined that indeed that what we needed was a strong, principled conservative who had demonstrated a record on standing on those things that Tennesseans believe represent their values. So that's how we came to be running for the United States Senate. Okay. So if you do happen to win this election, what are your immediate action items going to be and how are you going to go about it, executing them? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that Ted Cruz and Mike Lee know that they've got an ally. Um, those two gentlemen have done absolutely yeoman's work for carrying the conservative banner for all of us across this great country. And Tennessee needs to participate that in a much more active way than what we're getting out of our sitting senators. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let them know is that you've now got an ally in defunding Obamacare and standing against illegal immigrants and, and amnesty for those illegals and standing against higher taxes and standing against a federal government that wants to seize and control every aspect of our lives. And so I don't have anything in particular that I want to do. One of the things that's rather small but I, and, and may be insignificant, but one of the things that I do want to do when I get up there is I want to file a bill to repeal the ban on the incandescent light bulb and people will say well why do you want to do that that's so insignificant because the ban on the incandescent light bulb via congress through the epa is nothing more than a symbol of the overreaching federal bureaucracy into our lives and telling us things that everybody knows is neither practical nor pragmatic nor efficient and so that's one small thing that i would like to do but i think it represents my kind of belief where federal government fits into our, fits into our everyday lives so in other words it's um symbolic 
legislation is important. Oh, symbolic legislation is very important. Uh, and now, if you're doing it to grandstand and you're and you with no uh, perceivable genuine outcome, then yeah, it's just political posturing, and I'm not interested in that. But I think the, just to give up to give up to draw a finer point on this, the incandescent light bulb represents a broader overreach of the federal government through the EPA and how they hijacked uh, the idea from Congress and the Senate that somehow man, uh, uh, we were responsible for something called man-made global warming. And it was an effort to perpetuate a myth on the American people and to get us to pay for something that should have never we should have never bought in the first place. So it's representative of an overall bureaucracy that's ingrained in the government that says we know how to better run your lives well than you do. And that's of course an anathema to freedom loving citizens. There's a lot of people up in Congress and the Senate that have been in office for many, many years, as we know. <laughs> And term there, limits would help that. Yeah. Term <laughs> limits would help that a lot. And I'm a proponent. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Sure. But when somebody starts down that road of a question, I can't help but finish it. But I hope we can at some point in time get term limits. I know it would be have to require an amendment to the Constitution. But 12 years for any United States senator and any U.S. congressman is plenty. And that's where I, I, I wish we could get there sooner than later. Sorry. So do you support a, um, a, uh, an amendment process to the Constitution? I do, and that, and that on that particular issue, absolutely, I do. Is there any other amendments that you feel that need to be addressed or added or taken away? Well, I know that there's a lot of conversation right now about a constitutional convention, a concon, -con, and quite honestly, I understand the reason for that, and I hope it, I hope it, and it's going to take a while, but I hope it prevails in motivating Congress to act and quit ignoring the people and the states. What I would like to see in concert, because I don't believe a concon -con or constitutional convention necessarily removes the idea that we can continue to try to nullify some of these federal laws that I believe are unconstitutional. So I see the two working in parallel together. I think we need to continue to hammer the idea of nullification. We've got to get the states emboldened to the idea that there is a Tenth Amendment in the Bill of Rights and it specifically outlines their responsibilities and those things that aren't specifically given to the federal government in the Constitution, the states then have the authority to give and to take back to the federal government. We just need our federally elected officials, senators and Congress, to understand that they serve the people and the states and not the federal government. And how do we go about doing that? Um, we got to change the paradigm. Uh, the paradigm right now is, is that all states and all people look to Washington like baby birds for everything that they need for all their sustenance, and that's wrong. What we need in Washington is men and women from the Senate and from Congress representing the people of the state and then representing states. And that's the irony about running for the United States Senate since the 17th Amendment where the senators are now popular elected. It has d d diminished, decreased, and in some ways completely gotten away, got blown away the idea that the states have any sovereignty left because our founding fathers determined that our senators were supposed to represent the states. It's very difficult to see that that exists anymore, and I think I would like for us to return to that. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? I just want to thank you for Tintinship Productions for giving me this opportunity. I think it's great that you uh, follow constitutional conservatives around the state and promote the idea that we can liberate uh, the citizenry and America and the states and return back to what our founding fathers first gave us uh, through God Almighty, and that was, you know, liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm glad to be a part of the process, and I look forward to succeeding on August 7th. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. God bless. Thanks.